I've been looking over our agenda for the next several weeks. I know we have some tough issues coming up. And I want to discuss this agenda with you this morning. I have a few points to make and I'll answer to hear your concerns and suggestions. That's the reason my thinking of all the back there. All right. Um, before I turn to specific issues, let me just remind you that one of my highest priorities whether you share it or not, is keeping a Republican majority in the Senate. Over the past four and a half years, you've given great support, and for that I thank you, and teamwork has served as well, all of us. And it's this special unity that will continue to work for us now and right through November of 1986. Now, I just mentioned the deficit here, and I know that several of you Warren, Phil, others have been working on deficit reduction plans. And I've made some suggestions in this area myself and have repeatedly called for a line item veto. I've asked the Congress for a balanced budget constitutional amendment. And I've sent budget recommendations to the Congress outlining specific areas for funding reductions. And I welcome all efforts to reduce the deficit. We'll work with you to reach some viable method for doing this. But I hope these deficit plans can be considered on their own and not as just amendments to the deficit. <coughs> we need a clean deficit bill. And I know you'll soon consider one issue where teamwork will be critical, and that is increasing the debt ceiling. Jim Baker tells me we've already reached our current ceiling of one trillion eight hundred and twenty-four billion our cash balance will be exhausted by October 7th. I expect the Democrats will force Republican votes to pass the debt limit as they've done before. And I know that this isn't an easy vote for any of them. I don't like it either. But I'm just as anxious as you are to get to the real cause of our problem, which is the debts. At the moment, we have a responsibility to the American people to honor our financial commitments, both here and abroad. So I ask you to pass the debt limit. There's another item I want to discuss with you, and that's our tax reform proposal. You might have heard a rumor about that. <laughs> As you know, I've been on the road quite a bit recently talking about tax reform, and the reception I've had is very encouraging. <clears throat> when you find yourself in a town of 14,000 people and you're talking to over 20,000 people in an outdoor rally, standing there for a couple of hours in the sun, you figure they must be interested in tax reform. As a matter of fact, they had made very elaborate <coughs> banners and signs as, as big as that wall over there, uh, support and support of the uh, tax reform. There is strong support out there, changes in the current tax code to ensure fairness, simplicity, and economic growth. I think there's also a lack of understanding in part of many people yet as to what is in that program. And I know that time is short for dealing with a complex issue. Pressure will come from many interest groups who may resist some of these changes, but I believe we must move this year to complete action on tax reform, and again, I ask for your cooperation. And I think I've talked long enough here, and I'm anxious to hear what's on your mind, <coughs> so I'll ask our Majority leader to open the discussion with any comments he may have. First of all, Mr. President, we thank you for inviting us, and we want to uh, indicate that we certainly share your view with reference to the Republican majority after the 86 election. And we're very optimistic. We think the chances are excellent, and uh, notwithstanding some retirements that we didn't want to happen, but uh, they both promised to. Uh, they would be certain that the seat would be maintained, retained, sustained, whatever. Uh, so uh, we're, we're fairly hopeful in that area. I would also indicate that we, uh, as you pointed out, the agenda uh, is going to be a rather a busy one the next uh, 30 to 60 to 90 days. Uh, debt ceiling, of course, is the most immediate thing we'll have to deal with. There are a number of very good amendments uh, floating around. And, uh, <coughs> The, the uh, Graham Rudman Amendment is one of those. I was, I was really uh, enthusiastic about it until I saw the Washington Post indicated it was good this morning, so I'm going to go back and take another look at it. But, uh, 
that amendment, I think, is one that puts us back in the uh, sort of the mold of uh, fiscal responsibility deficit reduction. I've just shown to this table a recent Lou Harris poll where he's uh, polled the American people on whether Republicans in Congress or Democrats can do the best in all these areas. And he points out that in every benchmark, we've improved our position over last year, particularly in the area of deficit reduction. We picked up a number of points uh, uh, as far as Republicans in Congress are concerned. And so many of us believe that this might be an opportunity, and I can understand the need uh, for a clean debt ceiling. I share the view Bob Pack would, would probably express, but that's a matter that may take some debate. There are a number of amendments, and I won't go through all the amendments, but <coughs> Mattingly would like to put the line item veto on there. Bill Armstrong has an amendment on rescission. Uh, Senator Sims has an amendment. Somebody else says that it may be South Africa legislation, art, Jordan arms sales, anything can be offered on the debt ceiling. We also have the reconciliation bill, and I'll just mention that that is yet to be completed. We have a number of appropriation bills. We also have uh, a farm bill that I think is key to Republican uh, successes or chances in 1986. We have a number of farm state senators and a number of farm state senators where the polls indicate that the farmers are more than a little displeased with Republicans. So we have a, a real problem there. We've been trying to figure out something that's within the budget, as you requested, and as I think properly requested, and will still be perceived as a positive step for the American farmer. Jordan arms sales, uh, uh, that's just been, uh, just received that notification trade. I think, Mr. President, in my view, your speech uh, was very helpful. There will be a bill, a textual bill offered on the first appropriate vehicle I've advised by the distinguished senator from South Carolina, Senator Thurman, whether or not uh, that passes or whether or not a veto will be sustained. And then we have tax reform, and I think it makes a point we don't quarrel with any uh, I'm doing it, just a question whether we can do it this year. If we don't receive it, we can't pass it. The Constitution says the House acts first until <coughs> Thanksgiving. I don't believe uh, Bob Packwood can mark it up and pass it, go through a conference and have it on the President's desk by the end of the year. That seems the most unlikely possibility, but we're not unwilling. And if they give it to us, we'll act on it. We can't act on it until we receive it. Let me just ask something. The other night I was speaking to the, the, year of the inner circle, and I went something there and was amazed at the reception I got. And with our coming up election, and we know that there is going to be some legitimate primaries. And I hark back to 1966 when I ran for governor of California. That was the first year of the 11th commandment, and it was born in California. And it was the 11th commandment is, Thou shalt not speak ill of another Republican. But God bless them, the federated Republican women, they passed a resolution statewide that they would not support any Republican candidate who violated the primaries the 11th commandment. And so we had a campaign in which, Lord, in the governor's race, there were half a dozen of us. But no one ran against another Republican. You ran against the Democratic incumbent that you were trying to get rid of. And it worked. And we it, and then as the years have gone by, I think we've kind of forgotten. And I made a proposal to these people who were going to be supporting our candidates, the inner circle, that they should use their influence, because theirs is principally a fundraising thing, <coughs> to insist that we start that we go back to recognizing and practicing that eleventh commandment. Believe me, it works. Because if you campaign against each other in a primary, one is going to win. And then the opponents for their campaign in the general have all the things that the other Republicans said about this one that they can quote and say, look what his own party uh, said about him or her. And if they don't have that to go on, but if all in the primary have been pointing their finger at why there should be a Republican elected instead of the Democratic incumbent. Why, you could have a Senate without Craster. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, I can understand the, 
the sentiment for plain debt ceiling because obviously we don't want to get it tied up with a bunch of extraneous issues that really hamper our ability to do what we know we have to do and that is to raise the debt ceiling to pay the bills that after all Congress ran up. But I would urge you to look at the possibility of using this vehicle to not only pay the bills but call in the credit cards. What could be more appropriate than using the debt ceiling where we admit that the budget process has failed to try to reform the budget process? And let me remind you that the problem in trying to do that the way the rules of the Congress are set up under the Budget Act is that in the House, if you try to reform the Budget Act, it's referred to the one committee where all the members are appointed by the Speaker. So this may well be the only shot we get to try to reform the budget process and set out a concrete proposal during your administration where we could balance the budget by the end of this decade. And I know that's something that you support. And uh, as a principal uh, co-sponsor of this provision, I can assure you that if we make the effort, uh, that number one, I'm convinced we can win in the Senate and we can send this over to Tip O'Neill and let him tell the American people where he stands on an issue where by four to one margin they think it's more important than any other issue. But if we do fail, I can guarantee you that having had a chance to debate the number one issue in the country, that if we go through the process and we end up losing, I for one would turn around and support the debt ceiling. So I'm not trying to be an obstructionist. I want to use a vehicle that focuses the public attention on the number one problem in the country to remind the people that the Republican Party is the party of fiscal responsibility and a balanced budget. So I'd urge you to look at that proposal uh, to see if it might be something that you could support. Well, it's a, I think our fear about, and it doesn't have to do with something that's worthwhile as that, our fear is that because it is an absolute essential thing that you have to have, that that's the opportunity that there are some. <coughs> seize upon that to get things that they know otherwise we would or could never approve. I admit that uh, when I was talking to you that I found myself willing to compromise and accept an amendment with regard to the line item veto. <laughs> Mr. President, to return to tax reform for a moment, obviously if, if tax reform is, is put off until next year, <coughs> The coming on of the congressional elections will make it that much more difficult to resist special interest groups. Uh, Bob Dole's observation is, is, of course, correct, that the Senate can't act until the House sends us legislation. May I suggest that the White House, in its, in its political operation in, in this connection, begin to make that point to the American people, that it is the House and the Democrat-controlled House and the Democrat Party that is holding up tax reform. The Republican Senate is ready to act on it this year, but it's, it has to wait from, from, for the House. In the communications I've seen from the White House, including your great visit to my state, I didn't hear that point made, and I think it would be useful in putting heat on the House if the White House would begin to make that point. Well, I've worried, very frankly, I've worried that he may have up his sleeve hanging on long enough to get it over as late as possible. Yes and then have an item in which you can say, look at the Democrats passed uh, mm -hmm. this tax reform and the Republicans uh, preferred to go home and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't act on it. Now, I agree with you. We've given them some issues in the past few years every once in a while, and uh, we shouldn't give them another one, but let's make sure that they are not cooking up something with them if they, when they, if and when they pass it, that they can do this to us. <laughs> the President, with the trade issue up and uh, the textbook bill and the entire protectionism, I uh, am very frustrated with the direction of our, our energies being generated more in the merits of uh, one particular application of protectionism as opposed to what I feel uh, is what Americans basically want in America's industry, and that's access to foreign markets. And I see a great effort by the White House to uh, urge uh, my colleagues not to support the textile bill, the shoe bill has become a task. And that, in my opinion, is not really what we're looking for as far as relief. If we have accessibility to foreign markets, 
And if, I, if our energies are expended in opening up those markets, which is really an equitable uh, perception in the matter of free trade, well then I think we would accomplish uh, basically our purpose, which is to compete throughout the world on the basis of a free enterprise system in trade. But uh, we're getting mired down, and uh, while I know it's great to adopt a policy that's uniform, and uh, then you have behind you uh, these particulars, I think these matters of trade are such that the American public is going to want to see some positive achievements, and uh, <coughs> I just don't believe they're coming along fast enough because I don't think we're specifically asking for it. For example, the uh, matter of automobiles. The Japanese are bringing into this country 1.8 million. All those automobiles come in in Japanese carriers, Japanese ships, or ships controlled by Japan. Yet our unions and our steamship companies are willing to go to Japan, build automobile carriers in return for contracts to amortize them, and Nissan and so forth. But the administration won't come up and say to Japan, this is what we would like. We would like a participation. We're the country of origin, but we're not participating. And, and I think to expend our energies internally, fighting the merits of protectionism, when all we want is a fair shake, uh, I would respectfully suggest that we direct more of our energies into demanding simple justice <coughs> for this market accessibility. Well, this is this has been our position in a lot of the economic summits, summits ever since I've been here. Is this the, our drive for free trade? We've made some progress with some of our trading partners just because of this insistence. We still want another round of the gap to get at this very problem. We're going to continue to work on that. I still have to say that when it comes to protectionism, that no one can win a, in a trade war, and that's what it comes down to. We'll do everything with regard to unfairness. Think where you say they're they're holding up the market of theirs or shutting us out of that. There, we're going to use every bit of not only persuasion but power that we have. And we'll continue to do that, but. We've had it, the classic example of all was the smooth hauling in the Great Depression. And I was around looking for my first job in that Great Depression. And if you look at the pattern of that, how in 1929, <coughs> before the, the crash, smooth hauling had come and one house had passed it, and you had the big, great black day of, of the stock of the market going down. And then you had a great campaign on that it should not then come through the other house and so forth. And the recovery, believe it or not, the market actually began to recover <coughs> much of what it had lost in that big day. And then if you look at the schedule, I wish I had it here before me, I've got it at my desk, you'll find that then when it went ahead and passed, of both houses, over a thousand economists petitioned the president to not sign it. And there was another drop, almost as big as the first one. And of course, worldwide, it spread the depression. And there we were with our 25% unemployment in that Great Depression. The only thing that brought us out of the depression was World War II. But it was a trade war that would have still been, if it was still, still going on, there hadn't been the other kind of war. I don't know what would have happened, I think complete collapse. And for us to go down that road, we, I know we talk, and everyone's got to feel concerned about the people that are gonna lose a job. But all right, what about the people that lost the job in the automobile industry simply because they switched to robots for welding instead of a man at every welding spot? We've always had industrial changes and yet, as long as we find ourselves with more than 8 million more employees than we had a short time ago, uh, we must be doing something right. More than when we came here, we've got that many more employees. So I think we just have to look at it. Now, the funny turnaround that has happened, the Republicans were the ones that went for the high tariff. That was Republican policy. The Democrats were the party of free trade until the Democrats then in the New Deal made their unholy alliance with labor. 
and all of a sudden there's been a turnaround. And it's a funny thing to find out <coughs> how much the Republican Party of the day is like the earlier Democrat Party, and how the Democratic Party is the one that has definitely made the changes to protectionism and things of that kind. But I think we've got to tread very lightly. But if I just thing. follow up, that's my very point, Mr. President. If we had market accessibility, I don't think we'd have a fight internally over protectionism. And I think if we demand that we receive what is equitable in that consideration, and I think we're coming up to a very important philosophical point on this vote on textbook because it's representative not of an effort to, to encourage protectionism, but to vent frustration over an inequity that they're not addressing. <coughs> you know that in this whole trade imbalance that is somehow attributed to this, we have not reduced our exports. We're still the biggest in world trade. We've increased our imports because with our sound recovery, uh, which our trading partners have not shared, uh, their goods are bargains. Now, as they recover, and we're certainly trying to help them in every way on this, uh, money begins to correspond in valuation uh, to ours, then we're going to see a, a change. But, I think we, we've got to recognize that in many instances, when some things that we're talking about, we're talking about people losing jobs here because of, of imports. If you look at some of the countries that we're talking about, they actually have a trade imbalance with us, that we're selling them more things and more dollars worth than they are, than they're in, uh, selling to us. And you have to say, well, if we suddenly shut out or close down on them on some particular product through protectionism that is one of their principal exports. Well, they're just going to turn around and look at their own imports and say, well, we're going to clamp down and shut the door on those American uh, imports that we buy. There's one thing I've, I've told, I know some of you, <coughs> all of you, I'll repeat it anyway, that goes with my age. Uh, but I've always remembered when I was governor, Followed him his pickup truck home one night from the office, and uh, I hadn't seen one of them, what he had in his bumper since the Great Depression. But it was Buy American on a bumper. He was driving a Toyota. <laughs> <laughs> All of us uh, we <laughs> lately at the uh, at the cars there. On the other hand, look at it this way: Toyota, Nissan. Uh, one has built and another one is going to build uh, an automobile plant in our country. They're going to make them here. They're going to hire Americans to make those cars. They're building those plants with the dollars, the American dollars that they got from Americans buying their cars. But it all comes back to us in their investment here in this country. Mr. President, I would <coughs> urge you to, uh, and the White House, to give their strong support behind the grant. Uh, Rudman proposal added to the debt limit. Uh, I can tell you from, from working, I'm one of the class of 86. We were elected at the same time you were. There's 16 of us in here that work. Uh, the national debt at that time was less than a trillion. We're getting ready to cross two trillion. And I can tell you, in my opinion, that's probably the biggest liability that we have as far as re-election is the fact that the national debt has doubled since we've been in office. And I think we need to show something concretely that we have actually done. We have not been successful in getting the deficits under control. This, in my opinion, is probably the best plan that I've seen that actually does show us by passing a law that will make us have some responsibility. Maybe if it needs to be amended, let's amend it. But let's get behind something as a Republican Party and pass it. I can't vote for the debt limit unless we have something like that on it. And I guess there's probably several others in here likewise. So. It might help you pass the debt limit. Likewise, it politically, if we show that we pass something that shows some fiscal responsibility in the Senate, then we make them address it over in the House. The House would love a clean debt limit. They didn't have to vote on it. They haven't had to vote on anything that shows any type of fiscal uh, responsibility. So I, I just urge you to support this. Give us something so when we go back into our states, said yes, the debt limit did double in our first term, but we're now on a track to where it's going to be balanced in, in another four or five years. 
Well, don't worry about us. Not, we're not going to ignore that. We're going to be doing a lot of talking on this particular plan. In fact, we've been talking, as I told Phil here at the table, about a similar thing uh, before we knew about this. And so we're, we're tracking on that. Let me give you some answers, if I can. Maybe some of you have them already. About this idea that it is our big deficit and we did this. For 50 years, with only one or two years exception, we have run deficits, more than 50 years. And this is that we had both houses, and now we've had five years here, we've now five years, we had one, the one house, the Senate. All the rest of those 50 years, they have been in charge. Now, the deficit is structure. It is built in to the government structure. And it was greatly worse in the late 60s and 70s uh, after the Great Society was passed and Lyndon's program that was going to for the war on poverty. And as I said, so well, the poverty won. But if you look, 1965 to 1980, the budget increased. In 1980, the budget was almost five times what it had been in 1965. The deficit was 50 times what it had been in 1965. And in 1980, <clears throat> before we came here, was the largest deficit up until that time, $74 billion. And yes, it is bigger now, as the whole economy has gotten bigger. Not that much bigger if you look at it as a percentage of gross national product, instead of just counting the actual dollars. So this is a thing that is structurally built in and this is what we have to turn around. And so far, we've had opposition from the other side. If we've gotten the cuts that began in 1981, we asked for in our in our budget proposals. Uh, the deficit would be some $50 billion less right now than it presently is. But we have to, we're going to have to be the ones to face up and challenge them with programs that never should have been passed in the first place and should be eliminated with further reductions in others, and it's going to be our responsibility to do it. So I'm along with you on, on this proposal. But again, don't, don't listen to those ideas. The, the <coughs> debt, the national debt, at a time when we were having the highest tax increases in our history, before we got here, the national debt tripled. <coughs> Even though that only brought it up to a billion, it's not yes, we're going to the other billion. God only knows where to go if we don't get this structure changed. But what have we done that anyone could point to? Uh, in these four years, I've seen this thing, and even some of us have been tempted to say it. Oh, it's the defense spending, and it was the tax cut. The program that we started in 1981 that didn't go into effect completely until uh, going in 1984. But that doesn't figure out because in these four years of ours, with our tax cut, revenues for the government have increased 42% as of today. But spending has increased 60%. Now, before everybody jumps on, what they're trying to do and says, ah, defense spending. Defense spending today is 26% of the budget. It's almost 24% in the Carter administration. And his projection, five-year projection, when he was still in office, as to what defense spending would be, actually is higher than what we've been spending. So the things that they're trying to tag and blame on us, it wasn't the tax cut, consider the potential labor pool. Today, the highest percentage of that pool is employed than has ever been employed in our nation's history. So uh, by every figure, uh, we, we got a sound beyond the sound we got the point. But uh, I'm, I'm with you, and I think that what we're all talking about when we all get together is a program, not just quickly of this thing here or that thing there and seeing and we save a few dollars here or there. Let's have a program that then if they try to bust the budget, no, they're trying to break down a program that is aimed at balancing the budget. Is that what we want? Uh, 
I guess you know where I come from. <laughs> In my judgment, the race next year is going to depend on two things. One is the way we handle the deficit, and the other is the way we handle the trade laws. Now, since you've been in, the textile industry has lost 450,000 uh, jobs. My state's lost 24,000 jobs. You've got textiles in power in every state in this nation. Two million people engage in textiles in this country. Two million more are in related jobs. And I, I just want to say that uh, more than one half of all the goods used in this country today in Texas and apparel comes from abroad and not made in this country. John Hines had more textile jobs in his state than he had steel jobs. One tenth of all the manufacturing in this country is in textiles. 123 billion deficit in trade. 60 and a half billion is in textiles alone, 13 percent. The Defense Department says that, that textiles rank second to steel in the matter of national defense. In 10 years, it's estimated you won't have any textile industry here. Where are you going to get your uniforms from? Where are you going to get your parachutes from if we have a wall? I just want to call your attention to the fact that this is a vital industry in this country and it's being dissipated. Now, I think you've made the best president, and I've said it publicly, in the 31 years I've been in the Senate. But on this matter, uh, well, you've had bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> now, in my judgment, we have got to do something about this matter. I've been waiting and waiting to see what's going to be done. I put off in every way I could. And Three days ago, I received notice against this bill, all the points against it. One point was mentioned by the health of consumer, billions of dollars. Well, I've got some things to show that a shirt that costs eight dollars and something, you save almost seven cents if, it, if the goods are made overseas. Who's making the money? It's, the, it's not the consumer being saved, it's the retailers and the brokers making money. And that's the crowd that your advisors now contact over this country, retailers, brokers, and others, to propagandize the Congress to stop this bill. Now, I just want you to know the facts because somebody has misled you. Israeli-U.S. free trade agreement, 
which the administration supported and we passed and is going to go into effect in over 10 years, we'll have free trade with Israel. Now, it's a small country. They can flood us with textiles and it's not anything. It won't make that much difference. But the usual witnesses appeared against them, the textile industry and the leather industry and whatnot. There was one witness speaking for the textile and apparel industry, Bob Eisen, he's a good lobbyist, that posed the question to him, Mr. Eisen, could the American textile and apparel industry compete against foreign, fair competition in the United States? Fair. He paused for a moment and he said, textiles, yes. Apparel, no. And those are the fundamental questions you're going to have to resolve as certain <coughs> industries may not be able to compete against fair competition. And wage differentials are not counted as unfair. That cannot exist in this country any longer. So whether you're going to protect them from a standpoint of national security or whatnot, and they're tough decisions to make. And the, the great reason I was so struck in how little it was to make the difference. The next witness represented the California avocado growers. Didn't want the Israeli avocados. And I thought to myself, national defense, what do you do with an avocado? Mock hand grenades? <laughs> <laughs> And that is the that's issue that's right. going to come. And Strom puts it very well. I'm, I'm going to be on your side of this, not Strom's side. But what our manufacturers are going to be asking is for protection against fair competition, where they can no longer meet the competition, mainly because of extraordinary wage rate differentials. I don't know how you solve that. But part of the help in solving that is the first two things I talked about and Frank talked about, open foreign markets and very firm action against unfair foreign companies. I appreciate that, and let me just say that the other end of the hall in the East Room, a short time ago, some, a few of you were present also with all the trade leaders gathered there. I made a speech on trade there where I emphasized that we are going to move in every direction where there is unfair practice. <coughs> Up until now, the 301 actions and so forth have been brought to us by the industries and through the trade representative and so forth, and then we have taken action. This is the first time <coughs> I've ever said we're not going to wait for that, or wait for an industry to complain. We're going to, we're going to take the action ourselves, and that's going to be our policy from now on, and we will be doing that. Where it comes to the difference in simply wage rates, uh, and we do have the highest standard of living in the world. If you go all the way back to that economist Adam Smith, the, the basis of trade, if, if it's fair, this is not sliding over into giving anything else, the basis of tree, free trade has always been those who can produce the best for the least uh, have gotten the market. And we have always managed to have enough things that, as I say, we're still the greatest, we're the greatest exporter in the world today. And how do some of these lesser developed mm -hmm. countries, how do they become a trading partner? And how do they develop an economy in which they can now raise the standard of living for their people unless they have a market for things to sell? And if we turn around, as I say, and look in other directions, we find them buying other things from us. So it, it isn't a simple problem. And I know it is a distressing problem for an industry that faces that competition and finds itself shrinking. But you have to turn around then and look at well, what industries are growing uh, because of uh, our ability to provide something to these other countries. Now, the, the fact of, of a trade imbalance, now we're not talking about some industry that is is having struggle staying up there. But just the, the, the matter of the trade imbalance, in all the years of the Great Depression, when we were flat on our backs with the government putting ads on the radio saying, don't leave home looking for work, there is no work. We had a favorable trade balance. Now, Japan had an unfavorable uh, trade balance in all those 20 years after the war when it was coming up to the level that it has today. As a matter of fact, they've got a deficit that's uh, 
as a percentage of gross national product there is uh, about <coughs> comparable to ours. But the, the trade imbalance uh, has never been a setback. We, uh, when we had a trade imbalance in the 90 or so years from the beginning of the 1800s on up through that century, uh, we had a trade imbalance against us when we were growing and becoming the greatest economic power in the world, the greatest economic growth we've ever had. It isn't a simple problem, and I'm, we want to cooperate and work with all of you, and I'm getting a signal here that we're all supposed to go back to work with the economy. So, yeah. President, I, I would like to uh, say that I don't share your enthusiasm for tax reform, and uh, I think that we have fooled with the tax code uh, too often, very frankly. Uh, I also uh, would respectfully suggest that if you have talked to the members of the inner circle about tax reform or talked to uh, people in general, uh, they would tell you that it is a low priority compared to the, to the deficit. And uh, those of us who talked to the inner circle and indeed uh, polled the inner circle found that to be true. And I find that to be true uh, among my constituency as well. I think it's a rather hard sell to try to talk to my constituency at least about the percentage of gross national products, about 50 years of democratic uh, uh, hegemony and uh, say that uh, this is their fault and uh, not ours in the last four or five years. Uh, I find that a difficult uh, thing to sell. Uh, I might uh, say that, that I also uh, agree very much with your trade policy and also agree very much with the ideas of the 11th Commandment that you uh, said a little earlier. Uh, I must uh, also respectfully tell you that uh, your own White House does not always abide by it that rule. I try very carefully to do so uh, myself, uh, but I don't find that members of the White House are due on all occasions. I was particularly struck, Mr. President, uh, by the way that uh, Mrs. Heckler's uh, resignation was handled. And uh, uh, if I could get the same reaction, very frankly, and the same action uh, in uh, the White House that I do uh, in her agency when I have a constituent problem, I would be very pleased indeed. So uh, I endorse it. I, I campaigned for her against a fellow by the name of Frank. Uh, I have known her over the years and don't have any particular uh, reason for defending her, uh, except that I believe very strongly in the 11th Commandment and would uh, be happy to discuss uh, how I think the members of the White House could enhance that uh, belief. Let me just say, with regard to that last thing, I am planning before the day is over to amplify what I said to the press, as they said angrily yesterday. Um, all of this whole campaign, this isn't the first time. The lynch mob that, uh, with the, which consists of a great many of the press, has done this to any number of people in our administration. And then they leave off on one, having done their hatchet job or tried to and go to another. I had asked Margaret Heckler to serve as an ambassador. I really wanted her to do that. No criticism of her job, nor have I criticized it at all. And all this talk of dumping and everything else is just that, and that's what I'm going to tell the press. So uh, I, I have no, uh, uh, I, I quite understand that. However, my problem is uh, the, the fact that uh, a great deal preceded your own discussion with Mrs. Heckler and uh, it was uh, a matter of reporting it through the press and uh, having her pretty well tried and quartered uh, beforehand. You, you asked me, do we have people that leak in the administration uh, as well as on the Hill? And they do. Yes, we do. If you ask me, have we tried to find them? Have we beaten our heads on the walls saying what we'll do if we can ever locate some of these? You bet. On the other hand, I do think the press <clears throat> magnifies that. And many times, to say what they want to say uh, relies on that unnamed source and then just goes ahead with their own, their own story. But I'm going to try to quiet that. She's taken a bum rap and uh, undeserved, and we're not 
we're not going to hold still for it. And uh, as I say, these my plans. I haven't had an opportunity against coming here for breakfast to talk with our people about time and so forth. But um, I'm going to say that <coughs> some of the other points you raised about the tax reform, our own polling shows that the main thing is the bulk of the people in this country do not know what is in the tax reform. Now, for anyone to suggest that we don't need tax reform, good Lord, the only thing that Jimmy Carter said that I ever agreed with is when he said it's, our tax system is a disgrace. 250,000 people work for General Electric and pay more tax than General Electric does while it's making $8 billion in profit. Uh, a tax system that has people, I know <laughs> when I was getting some of that if money in Hollywood, my biggest problem was what was I going to do to try and avoid a 94% tax bracket? And how many times did people like myself out there uh, offered a script or a picture, said, no, I can't make another picture this year because I only get a dime and a dollar if I make it. And when you didn't make that picture, how many times that picture wasn't made? So the other people who were sitting at home, from the bit players to the grips to the technicians, they didn't get that phone call saying, report to the studio, uh, uh, we're making a picture. Well, this is the kind of tax policy that we've had. Now, we've helped some with the uh, reductions that we made in 81, and they paid off. We're getting more money at those rates than our friends on the other side of the aisle were getting at the higher rates. But Tax reform is basically going to give the people of this country a tax reduction without reducing the revenues that the government is going to get. I don't know how anyone could argue with a, 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 a simple thing like that. And I'm not going to give up on the fact that your constituency is not uh, pounding on your door on this. As I've said, <coughs> they don't know what it's all about yet. And we haven't been able, uh, I heard, uh, a discussion program on the air between some of the correspondents, some of the leading uh, commentators. And they were discussing how they weren't going to talk anymore. I go out and make speeches on trying to explain the tax reform. They weren't going to report that anymore because uh, they'd reported it once, so it isn't news. <coughs> in fact, I'm in a different town speaking to a different audience. Uh, no, they find some thing to talk about. Did I stumble on the steps getting up on the dais? Or, uh, <laughs> that was the joke I told, uh, but so they're not reporting. We're going to have to get the message out. What is the tax reform program? What does it do for the people? And what it does for the people is it catches up with some people that right now we're losing about $95 billion a year in people that are not paying the tax they fairly should be paying. Now, they're not stealing, and they're not out there breaking the law. They're evading or avoiding, not evading, avoiding the tax legally through the provisions that are in the tax code and that we can correct. And it shouldn't be there. But I know I've gone way over. Thank you, Mr.